The urinary system does more than you might think. The obvious functions are excretory and urine formation, transport, storage, and release, but it does quite a lot more. Since it is a regulator of how much water is in the blood, it can impact blood pressure, but it can also stimulate blood cell formation. Vitamin D is made from the interaction of sunlight and your skin, but it gets activated to perform its hormone function by the kidney cells. Your blood must stay within a very narrow range of pH for critical chemical reactions to occur and to prevent damage to cells and tissues. The urinary system is vital in keeping the pH in proper balance. So as you see here in the list, seven functions in total for the urinary system. Let's begin with a big picture view of the urinary system. It is comprised of the kidneys, ureter, bladder, and urethra. The right kidney is lower than the left kidney due to the liver being large. In a view from above, you can see that the digestive organs are in a separate cavity from the urinary system. The peritoneal cavity houses the digestive organs and has a serous membrane which secretes a small amount of fluid in the cavity that lubricates the organs so that they experience very little friction as they move about inside of the body. The kidneys are in the retroperitoneal cavity. Literally, that means behind the peritoneal cavity. Unlike the digestive organs, the kidneys are not allowed to move much when the body moves. They're held in place by pararenal fat. This fat firmly holds them in place. If someone gets too emaciated, the kidneys can slip, causing the ureter to get pinched. We will begin by examining the urinary system in depth with the kidneys. They are about the size of clenched fists. The outer covering of the kidney is the renal capsule. It's made up of fibrous connective tissue. The renal artery and the vein connect the kidney to the circulatory system. As blood enters the kidney, it is first taken to the nephron, which is housed partially in the cortex and partially in the medulla of the kidney. The medulla has an alternate name of renal pyramid, and at the tip of the renal pyramid is the renal papillae. The nephrons are the key functional units of the kidney. The materials removed from the blood are then dumped into the minor and major calyx, renal pelvis, and ureters to make its way to the bladder. One of the best analogies for kidney function is called the desk drawer analogy. Suppose you need to clean out a desk drawer. There are basically two ways you could do it. You could open the desk drawer and start picking out the stuff you need to get rid of. When you're done picking out the junk, everything left in the drawer is good and the drawer is clean. Alternatively, you could dump everything onto the top of the desk and then put the good stuff back into the drawer. That's how the kidneys clean the blood. Plasma is dumped into the nephron and then the good stuff is pulled back into the blood vessels. The rest becomes urine. It does this in four steps. 1. Glomerular filtration. 2. Reabsorption. 3. Is secretion. And 4. Is reabsorption of the water. In some texts, step 2 and 4 are combined, but we'll handle them separately here. Let's look at each of these steps one by one in more detail. Step 1 is glomerular filtration. The name's a logical one since it happens primarily in the glomerulus, which is housed inside the Bowman's capsule. The Bowman's capsule is made up of a parietal layer of simple squamous epithelium. It opens into the proximal convoluted tubule. The glomerulus receives the blood by the afferent arteriole. Embedded in the arterial wall are granular cells, or another name for them is juxtaglomerular cells. These we're going to learn more about a bit later. There are holes in the glomerular capillaries. The holes are called fenestrae, and they make these capillaries more porous than other capillaries in the body. The glomerulus is a visceral layer composed of podocytes, which are specialized cells that actually attach to the glomerular capillaries by means of small processes called foot processes. The purpose of the design is to allow everything but the blood cells and proteins to leave the blood vessels. The liquid that has left the blood supply here is called filtrate, and it's essentially the same as interstitial fluid in composition. Notice that the afferent arteriole is considerably larger than the efferent arteriole. There are two reasons for that. One is that the blood supply leaving the glomerulus will have part of the volume removed due to the filtering. But the purpose is also to keep the pressure in the glomerulus high enough that the filtrate can leave the glomerulus efficiently. Average adults have 5 liters of blood and the volume passes through the heart every minute. The blood flow to the kidneys is about 20% of that. 
So the renal blood flow rate coming through the glomerulus is about one liter of blood per minute, which is about one-fifth the total blood supply of your body. The amount of pressure inside the glomerulus is 55 millimeters mercury. There is a counter pressure too. Water tries to go back into the glomerulus because of osmosis. This is colloid osmotic pressure and it amounts to about 30 millimeters of mercury pushing back in. There is also capsular pressure that comes from the walls of the Bowman capsule resisting overfilling by the filtrate. It runs about 15 millimeters mercury. Overall, then, the outward pressure sending the filtrate down the proximal tube is about 10 millimeters of mercury. If the pressure gets out of balance, then renal shutdown is a very real possibility because the blood cannot be filtrated. Some possible causes of the pressure drop are hemorrhage or severe dehydration. We are now to step two of your information, reabsorption. Now, we will get a chance to see what's happening in the rest of the nephron. Before we get to the names of these new structures, we will get a big picture idea of what's happening here. There are 1.3 million nephrons in each kidney. To survive, you must have at least one-third of them functional. They are located in the cortex and the medulla of the kidney. You have been introduced to the filtration system that occurs in the Bowman's capsule. The filtrate has a lot of substances in it, including things that you don't want to lose. In our desk drawer analogy, once you dump the whole drawer out, you now are to select what goes back into the drawer that you want to keep. This is absorption. Some of the good things that you want to return to the blood supply are water, sodium, and water-soluble vitamins. The reabsorption is going to occur in the remaining parts of the nephron, such as the loop of Henle. It's a section that narrows and loops back up in the medulla of the kidney. There's only about 10% of the nephrons in the kidney that have the loop of Henle. As the filtrate goes through the tubules and loop of the nephron, they pass close to the network of paratubular capillaries. These capillaries are what the nephron is trying to get the good stuff back to. Let's continue our filtrate's journey from the Bowman's capsule and glomerulus, which together are called the renal capsule. The walls of the nephron tubule are very thin. The one nearest the Bowman's capsule is the proximal tube. Proximal means close to. It's made up of simple cuboidal epithelium because there has to be room for cellular machinery to facilitate reabsorption. The cells have a brush border to increase surface area, much like the intestines have the villi. This increases the rate of absorption. Most of the reabsorption happens in the proximal tubule. 65% of the water and virtually 100% of the glucose will be absorbed to be returned to the paratubular capillaries from this structure. The loops at Henle is made up of simple squamous cells. It leads to the distal tubule, distal means far away, and the collecting ducts. When the filtrate enters the collecting tubule, then it's officially urine. There are two types of reabsorption, active and passive. The materials that must be actively absorbed are nutrients, amino acids, and glucose. These will not normally pass through the membranes of the nephron. To move these materials back into the blood supply, energy in the form of ATP must be expended and carriers must be used. Tubular maximus, or Tmax, is the maximum rate of reabsorption by active transport through the nephron tubules. This limit occurs because there are a finite number of carriers taking the materials out of the filtrate. The carrier's quantity is calibrated to what the body needs. If you need a lot of a substance, more carriers will be there to perform the job of getting the substance back into the blood supply. If you need only a little, then only a few carriers for that substance will be provided. You hit the T-max when all the carriers are busy and some of the material then passes to become the urine without being reabsorbed. Sodium is usually in urine since we take in so much of it that we're usually at T-max. If glucose levels are too high, you will spill glucose in the urine because it's at T-max. The glomerulus isn't supposed to let proteins get through, but if a few proteins did slip through the filtration process, they will be returned to the blood supply through pinocytosis. Next, let's look at passive absorption. Substances that are passively absorbed move freely through the membranes because of differences in concentration. The proximal tubule will have internal and external concentrations that are about equal. The descending limb of the loop of Henle will have a filtrate that is of higher concentration than that of the fluids in the blood plasma. 
The ascending loop will have much of the filtrate substances removed, so the blood plasma now will have a higher concentration. The distal tubule will be in an area where the blood plasma will have higher concentration than the filtrate. Some of the substances that will be passively absorbed are water, urea, and chlorine ions. Some chemicals that have passed back into the blood we don't want there. They must be secreted back into the nephron to head to the urine. The destro analogy helps us understand this. After adding things back into the destro, you may have decided, oh, I don't want this after all, and you put it back in the junk pile to be thrown away. You secrete it back to the junk pile. Step four is water reabsorption. Some sections of the nephron are permeable and others impermeable to water. These variations of permeability are essential to the control of water levels that return to the blood. In the distal tube and the descending loop of Henle, the membranes are permeable to water. The interstitial fluid in the kidneys here reach up to four times more concentrated than the rest of the body as you move toward the tip of the loop. This efficiently pulls the water out of the tubule and the loop and into the medulla. The vasa recta capillary and the medulla then reabsorb the water. The ascending limb of the loop of Henle is impermeable to water. Its job is to actively move electrolytes back into the blood flow. The distal tubule and the collecting duct vary their permeability based on ADH levels. ADH is produced in the hypothalamus in response to cell shrinkage. If the cells shrink, it's because the concentration in the blood plasma is too high so that the water in the cells move out toward the higher concentration. This cell shrinkage can damage the cell. It will be important to get more water into the plasma to reduce concentration there. The reverse can be the case as well, and the lack of ADH will slow the amount of water that continues to be absorbed in the distal tubule and the collecting duct. Transitional squamous epithelium line the bladder. With this, it allows the bladder to stretch without tearing, and it can go from the size of a thumb when it's empty to pretty good size whenever the bladder is full. Notice that there are two sphincters. One is involuntary and the other is voluntary. We have the automatic system even by the time we're babies. A full bladder results in an impulse to the spinal column which then signals the internal sphincter to relax and allows the urine to flow. Myelination of the nervous system so the spinal column can send a signal to the cerebral cortex will then give us control of the voluntary valve called the external urinary sphincter. Before the myelination, it opens with the other sphincter automatically. As we age, we lose our nervous system control and the system reverts back to the way it was when we were babies. This is called incontinence. When we listed the seven functions of the urinary system, number four was blood pressure control. This is because the kidneys can regulate how much water is in the blood. The more water there is, the higher the blood pressure. You cannot just add water to the blood supply, though. If concentration doesn't stay balanced in the plasma, diffusion and osmosis will get messed up. So with the water, you have to also control the solutes that go along with it into the blood. The afferent arterial has juxtoglomerular cells, also called granular cells. These detect the blood sodium levels and blood pressure. Drops in either of these release renin. Renin is an enzyme that will activate angiotensin in the liver. Ogen means precursor, angio means blood vessel, and tensin means pressure. When the above two interact, a peptide called angiotensin 1 is produced, which interacts with enzymes in the lungs, creating angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2, 1, increases vasoconstriction powerfully, 2, makes you thirsty, 3, makes you want salt, and 4, releases aldosterol, which increases sodium reabsorption. More salt will cause more water to be retained and increase blood pressure. When volume is high, it stretches the atria, which triggers natriuretic hormone release. This hormone inhibits the nephrons from reabsorbing sodium, which lowers water levels, bringing blood pressure down. The last function we will discuss is pH control. Normal pH ranges from 7.35 to 7.45. That's a pretty narrow range to have to keep things in. This would be the pH of the blood, though, not the cells. Cells are a bit more acidic inside because of the carbon dioxide being produced. Notice it isn't even 7.0, which on the pH scale would be considered neutral. 
neutral would actually not allow life to continue. If the blood becomes too acidic, acidosis occurs. This will decrease the nervous system's action, leading to coma and death. Alkalosis is when the blood pH increases to become more alkaline. It results in overexcitement of the nervous system, leading to convulsions. There are key pH changes that can occur. Vomiting can lead to alkalosis. Diarrhea can lead to acidosis. Kidney dysfunction could happen either way. If the kidneys get messed up, then blood pH can be all over the place. So how do we control pH? Well, the body has a buffer system. It's the least efficient, but it's quick. It includes buffers such as bicarbonate, phosphate, and there are a few proteins that help too. These are basically weak acids, weak bases. The respiratory system plays a part too. It's a bit slower, but it's more effective than what we have with the buffer system. The kidney secretion of hydrogen ions, the more of it we have, the more acidic you have, is the most effective, but it's the slowest. It lowers the pH of the blood and raises the pH of the urine. 